Those of you who are regularly on this call, this is actually our 36th month of doing this month in cybersecurity. You may be used to hearing a Bruce Ward uh, on these calls, but we let him go on vacation, and uh, I'm taking over for this month. So uh, if this is your first time on the call, we have the next 30 minutes dedicated to um, taking time to uh, analyze different cybersecurity stories from the past month and specifically look at them through the frame of uh, how they are impacting small and medium businesses, uh, trying to understand uh, how the threat landscape is evolving and some tactics for mitigating some of the issues. So with that, let's go ahead and get into it. Again, this is if you've been on these before, this is probably a slide you've seen before. You've heard us talk about the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and so this is a way uh, to help us uh, simplify the cybersecurity environment, understanding the different uh, things that we need to account for. So the first step is identifying uh, the the different data that we have, how we need to protect it, specifically, uh, you know, what is our most sensitive data, uh, moving through to protection, things like uh, antivirus uh, or, or other protection methods uh, that you might set on, say, your firewall. Uh, detection is something that we put in the center of the, uh, the cybersecurity frame framework as kind of central to uh, knowing when you've been breached. Um, there's uh, those of you uh, who have been in the security side of things for a while may be uh, familiar with the, the phrase that there are companies um, who have been breached and know about it and companies who have been breached and don't know about it. Um, and so uh, having quick detection time is important. Uh, and then we move into how you react to things, um, responding and recovering from cybersecurity incidents. Uh, I've got five stories to talk about this week, um, but uh, I, I do want to reframe some of the stories that uh, Bruce covered last month, uh, just because we're going to be talking uh, a little bit more about uh, some updates on those. So uh, I know last month, uh, both Google and Microsoft were kind of picked on um, Google for some security issues in, in uh, how some of their products are managed and Microsoft uh, for some large uh, patch releases. We talked about new phishing methods that had come up, uh, and then uh, we had talked about a few new uh, attack vectors that we'd seen in uh, DNS espionage and form jacking. So uh, these things will come up a little bit, or at least evolutions of these themes will come up in today's conversation. Uh, the five stories we're going to talk about is some of the dangers within default settings, and I know we've talked about this with Microsoft before, um, specifically around some of their Office 365 stuff. Uh, we will explore that a little bit deeper in, uh, in our first news item. Uh, the importance of patching and some new patches released this month. We will discuss a major breach uh, that occurred with Citrix, which you may have heard about. And then there is a new um, mobile app uh, virus that, that is out there um, that we'll cover. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, the rise of a new uh, kind of variation on phishing, which is the sextortion scam, something we've seen at some of our customers already. So some of the things that were covered last month that we're now compiling into this list of default danger um, was some, some of the ways that Nest cameras were uh, configured with default admin logins and passwords. Um, some of the uh, Office 365 defaults, which we're going to dive a little bit deeper in today, um, but specifically we talked about auditing not being on um, for, uh, for tenants uh, and Microsoft Teams allowing anonymous join for meetings. Um, and then some uh, SQL uh, login uh, defaults, as well as some firewall and router login. So those were all covered last month um, in, in uh, Bruce's conversation. This month, uh, I have a couple of new folks to talk about. Uh, the first one of those is Comcast and Xfinity Mobile. And in, in both examples I'm going to use on this slide, it's really... Uh, about an organization trying to develop a feature that they ostensibly is for convenience purposes for a user that ultimately weakens the security standing. Um, in Comcast um, uh, 
space, they launched their Xfinity mobile platform about two years ago. Some of you may be familiar with it. If you are a Comcast customer for internet or for um, television, they have likely uh, pushed this service on you. Um, but they started their own um, mobile service, and one of the convenience features that they touted of this service is that porting your number over to them um, was seamless. There is uh, no PIN number that needs to be used, um, this, which makes it easier for us to move our, our numbers. Um, as it turns out, there is a PIN number that is used. Uh, that PIN number is set to 0000. zero, zero, zero and is a PIN number that cannot be changed by um, by the end user. A customer uh, did not have knowledge of this, uh, nor could they change it. Um, so what ended up happening is a number of Verizon customer, or a number of, uh, I'm sorry, Comcast customers who had moved their number over to Xfinity had this default PIN number they weren't aware of, um, and people looking to uh, commit identity theft against those customers figured this out and uh, ported their number over to a different provider using that uh, default PIN number and um, and then from from there they were able to uh, steal their identity. Um, this goes back to uh, some of the things we've talked about with SIM card swapping is that once that uh, that number is compromised some of the multi-factor authentication methods, specifically texting and phone call, um, it can be a little bit problematic in that if if your SIM card or your mobile number is compromised, uh, you're going to have uh, somebody's going to be able to compromise your account with your stolen credentials. Um, so that goes back a little bit to focusing on you know having MFA through an application uh, as opposed to using uh, a text message. The next one on here is Equifax, um, and Equifax, obviously, we know about the major breach that occurred um, last summer, um, but uh, one of the things that happened in the aftermath of that breach was a lot of people went out and froze their credit accounts with the three major credit bureaus, which is all um, good. Uh, it's, it's common advice given uh, to, to people um, so that changes to your uh, credit history and your credit report. Uh, people can't request credit in your um, without your report being unfrozen. Um, around that time, Equifax also launched this My Equifax tool to help you uh, manage this. But one of the holes that was discovered by Brian Krebs of Krebs on Security is that um, you can go and create a My Equifax account using social security number, using a date of birth, um, something that uh, is out there, uh, un unfortunately, on the dark web, some, something that is accessible to um, criminals. And you can unfreeze one of these reports without the use of a PIN number that would have been set during the freezing process. Um, and so it does represent a, uh, a security issue um, for folks that have frozen their uh, credit reports. They may not be as um, frozen as we think or as secure as we'd like to think. Moving on more uh, into the business side of things and some of the default um, settings. Uh, so, one, as I mentioned, we've talked about Office 365 default settings before. There's a lot of things that um, our engineers are configuring as part of best practices when we spin up a new tenant um, for, for an organization just to make sure some of the security stuff is configured. Um, and then we have the additional problem of Microsoft introducing new features with new default settings on them that, uh, again, aren't always thought of from a security frame, thought of more from a, uh, a usability and convenience frame and getting somebody started without too many hurdles. Um, so the default danger I want to talk about here is um, Microsoft leaves IMAP and POP protocols enabled on all mailboxes by default. Um, so these are older legacy protocols um, that don't always support the newer security functions that, that we like to implement for customers. Um, so one of the newest things that uh, was discovered is that attackers are exploiting the those mailboxes that still have IMAP or POP3 enabled uh, to 
bypass multi-factor authentication. So uh, a growing list of our customers are implementing multi-factor authentication. We use it at Peters and Associates uh, to help secure our mailboxes. But if you still have mailboxes that have um, IMAP enabled, that MFA that you've set up and you've gone through the trouble of educating your users on uh, could easily be bypassed uh, if IMAP is still turned on for that um, for that mailbox. So uh, what was discovered in this article is that uh, organiza- or that uh, bad actors were using an attack method called password spraying to uh, attempt to access these accounts, and in many cases they were successful. Um, password spraying uh, attacks are a little bit different than, say, a brute force attack. Uh, a, a password spraying attack will try a uh, lot of different usernames against one single password, whereas a brute force attack looks at one username with a bunch of different uh, password variations on it. Uh, And so the end result of this is that in a brute force attack, usually we have security methods easily in place that will lock out an account if too many login attempts have been attempted. Um, or there's uh, other reporting that we might get on that. A password spraying attack, uh, because it's not hitting the same account, um, and we can't see that it's the same password being tried on all of these, uh, it's less likely to set off alarms unless you have processes in place for um, checking and making sure that uh, you know that you're not seeing this kind of activity in your audit logs. Um, I know we just had this experience um, over the weekend. Uh, we noticed a number of failed MFA attempts. All of them were failed against our credentials, but it's something that our organization keeps an eye on and tracks and knows that we were being targeted um, with this. So um, it's just from a statistical perspective uh, from this, based on this report, uh, they found that 60% of Office 365 and G Suite um, uh, tenants have been targeted with IMAP-based password spraying attacks. Of those 60%, uh, 25% of them had experienced a, a successful breach. And overall, 15 out of every 10,000 active user accounts were successfully breached by attackers through this attack vector. Um, so something that you need to, to keep an eye on. From a solution perspective, I, I talked about this a little bit before, um, but some of the things that we like to track as our indicators of compromise in Office 365, one is foreign mailbox access, or ma- mailbox access from a foreign uh, country or a country that is not assigned to that user. Um, you might know if you administer your Office 365 tenant, users are uh, designated to a country. Uh, when you have access from outside that country, it indicates potential compromise. And so um, that is, uh, that's something that, that we keep a close eye on. Uh, for mailbox forwarding, especially for forwarding to things like Gmail, a common attack, uh, a common uh, uh, um, thing that a hacker will do is to start once they've compromised a mailbox, they'll start forwarding those emails to another mailbox um, for them to have, uh, whether they're going to hold them ransom or uh, whether they just want that uh, that data elsewhere um, to sell. Uh, we talked about this in in the open of this story, IMAP and POP3 access. Um, so. Most mailboxes don't require that today. Uh, We're going to start flagging mailboxes that uh, do have that turned on as a potential threat vector. Uh, Mailboxes that haven't been logged into for a long time. So is something broken in your offboarding process where uh, we've had an employee that left, you know, six months ago, but their mailbox is still um, open. Their account is still open. um, And Theoretically, uh, it, it's another um, attack vector, vector to compromise those credentials. Uh, same goes for administrators, uh, keeping an eye on uh, active administrators of the Office 365 tenant. And then, um, again, on the auditing path, making sure we have full auditing coverage. In general, um, we see no reason to have auditing functions turned off for mailboxes. Uh, the one case where we've seen it uh, be problematic is if you are doing backup of your Office 365 tenant. And in that case, uh, it's something that just needs to be reviewed um, frequently as it becomes a uh, potential uh, threat. 
Uh, and then one thing that Peters and Associates is doing, uh, looking at all those things that are listed on the, the last slide, uh, on a daily basis, we're looking at the foreign mailbox logins, a weekly base, basis, about 20 different indicators of compromise at this point. And then on an annual basis, we're up to probably somewhere around 50 things that uh, we're reviewing manually. Um, uh, as well as running some of those reports and looking at some of the things provided by Microsoft, like the Secure Score. Um, more Patch Tuesday news um, and patching themes. So Microsoft uh, released a bunch of new patches this month. Um, several critical items again in this release, and those things you know you want to have implemented in about 15 to 30 days. Uh, understanding that there is some testing that you'll have to do. Uh, broken pa broken patches are not unheard of, um, but testing and making sure you have a plan in place for um, distributing those. Uh, this is the third month in a row of issues with DHCP on uh, Windows Server. So DHCP is something that you'd consider a foundational service, um, something that hands out IP addresses, and theoretically a uh, malformed packet uh, could cause huge problems in your environment, uh, with the silver lining of that being that it is still hard to exploit that these things. But uh, the overall point is that once Microsoft uh, or any vendor releases these patches uh, for especially zero day patches, uh, attackers are now going to be on high alert for targeting these systems that haven't been patched yet. This is the same kind of thing that happened with WannaCry a couple years ago, uh, in which the patch had re been released a month before, uh, but a number of systems, particularly in the UK healthcare system, uh, had not been patched yet. And so... Uh, uh, attackers kind of see this as the starter's pistol. If they aren't already aware, aware of a vulnerability, um, they will use this to their advantage if you aren't patching. Uh, so one of the most important patches released was for uh, an exposure which combines vulnerabilities in Windows 7 as well as Windows Server 2008 when combined with um, Google Chrome. So two of the more popular operating systems combined with uh, the most popular browser um, represents a pretty big issue for a lot of organizations. Uh, so if you don't patch this, uh, the machine is open to local privilege escalation on that device. This has been spotted in the field by mo both uh, Microsoft and Google seeing bad actors dropping malicious code onto machines. So this is something you wanna make sure you have patched right away. Um, from a uh, resolution perspective, make sure all your Chrome browsers are updated. Uh, the current update on Chrome is 72.0.3626.121 or later, uh, and then upgrade to Windows 10 as this did not impact that operating system. And I know a number of you are already focused on your uh, Windows 10 upgrade process. Um, from a Peter solution perspective, uh, we do likely patch more systems uh, the, in a month than a lot of you do in a year. Um, so we can take responsibility for patching servers. We do this for a few thousand uh, systems at this point each month. Uh, pricing varies on this depending on your environment health as well as your um, as well as your uh, uh, size, but you know, somewhere between six and ten dollars uh, per server per month uh, covers our server patching service. We also, uh, on this screen, you can see our Pulse Complete Server Management, which includes that patching, but also includes antivirus uh, and also includes um, proactive and limited support for troubleshooting in our customer environments on server issues. Pricing on that also again varies by general health of the environment and of those servers, as well as um, size, but can uh, fall somewhere in a range between 50 and uh, $100 per server per month. Um, but again, if you'd like to do it yourself, just make sure you get those Microsoft and Google patches implemented within the, uh, the next couple of weeks here. Um, okay, Citrix. Some of you may have read about this. Um, this is uh, what we are chalking up as the largest breach of the month. Um, so Citrix, a lot of you are familiar with. They provide virtual private network access and credentials to 400,000 companies and other organizations worldwide. About 98% of the Fortune 500 are using Citrix. Um, 
their internal network was compromised, uh, and there's still a lot of the facts being sorted out at this point. I believe there's uh, finger pointing to uh, a international hacking group in uh, based out of Iran. I think they are uh, government backed, likely. Um, but from a method perspective, it does sound like password spraying was the um, primary vector that the internal network was was compromised for. Uh, in reading the story and reading up on this and what we know so far, customer data was compromised. Documents were um, pulled down from this environment. And uh, again, there's not enough known to say exactly what uh, was compromised from a customer perspective, but uh, we do know that there is some general guidance out there. Uh, UK's National Cybersecurity Center said uh, about 75% of organizations had accounts with passwords uh, that featured in the top 1,000 passwords. 87% uh, had accounts with passwords that uh, featured in the um, in the top uh, 10,000. So again, that's that's that password spray effectiveness uh, when people are using common passwords. Uh, so it's a good time and a good lesson for for those of us that manage our security in our network to make sure we have a password policy in place and um, are testing against password spray attacks. Microsoft Office 365 does have a, a native tool for helping, uh, helping out with this. Um, again, not a ton of guidance on what you can do if you are a Citrix customer. Uh, it wasn't your personal Citrix environment that was accessed. Like I said, it's customer data within the internal Citrix network. Um, so we're still waiting on more information, but you, in the meantime, some things to look at in your own environment and take lessons from. Uh, evaluate your own accounts for, for password spraying. Um, password changes, if you have, if you don't have a policy in place today or if you're overdue or have some accounts overdue, make sure you're undergoing that. Uh, and then the uh, the other goal should be to, to look at and to leverage multi-factor authentication. Um, again, that tends to be, that and cybersecurity awareness training tend to be the two of the best methods for preventing some of these attacks, making sure people have secure passwords, uh, and making sure that if a password is compromised, that other piece of authentication uh, can prevent uh, access to, uh, to bad actors. Um, and then lastly, reconciling accounts in Active Directory with employees with your uh, HR team. So uh, again, this goes to the onboarding, offboarding process, making sure that's functioning properly. And if you do have stale accounts out there, making sure that they are uh, disabled. Okay, our fourth story that we had this month is mobile app malware, something that we're starting to see a little bit more of, and uh, this is still a big, uh, kind of a big can of worms that organizations are still trying to get their arms around. So uh, in this specific case, uh, researchers discovered a adware strain uh, that was present in a software development toolkit that was used by developer, developers for more than 200 applications in the Google Play Store. Um, this was just removed in March 2019. Uh, so anything uh, that was developed on there uh, contains this uh, adware strain. Uh, right now, I think the biggest lesson is getting your arms around mobile device management and how you handle this kinds of thing. Um, Android still does tend to be the greatest threat vector when it comes to um, uh, policing adware, malicious apps in their, um, in their Play Store, though uh, we know iOS is definitely not immune from this too. They've they've also had privacy concern issues. Um, so the question to a lot of organizations is, how do you know if this application or these 200 applications are running on your uh, any of your corporate devices? Uh, there's been roughly 150 million downloads of these 200 applications, and um, you, you need to have a way of determining if that's uh, if that could possibly be running on your devices. Um, the other point too, at this time, the adware isn't malicious. This is just pop-ups. But the larger point is that uh, this is indeed a, a, a Trojan horse into the mobile operating system that could potentially offer data exfiltration, um, phone home to a command and control server, remote execution. Uh, it is just a, another backdoor that uh, other bad actors could take advantage of. So in this case, uh, I don't know that it's necessarily uh, go out and be concerned about this Simbad mobile 
mobile app malware, it's the larger point is getting a handle on how you're managing those mobile devices. So um, it, there's a lot of mobile de uh, mobile device management tools out there, um, and I know organizations over the past five years or so have been uh, starting to invest in these applications. There's a great range of features and, and functionality um, that largely, you know, depends on what your organizational needs are. A lot of organizations are doing kind of the basics in terms of having a password required on the device. Um, but the point is, this is an area that needs to be explored. Um, Peters and Associates does do this as part of our um, complete end user management solution today. But uh, this can additionally be managed by uh, an organization itself. Uh, it's a matter of lining up functionality and needs with, uh, with some of the solutions that are out in the market. Uh, the last one is not necessarily tied to a specific attack. It's more about updating on a new threat factor that we are seeing out there. We've already seen it at a couple of customers, as I mentioned. Um, so this is, uh, first of all, just adding to your vocabulary of attacks. So Bruce has talked about um, DNS espionage before. He's talked about what form jacking is. He's talked about robocalls. And we've talked today about password spraying attacks. Um, the newest one that, that is out there is uh, sextortion. So like I said, I've seen at least one customer who's gotten this attack and, and asked us about this, but the main crux of sextortion attacks is scammers uh, claim to have a compromising video of an individual and they then threaten to share it with all their contacts unless they pay up. Um, this is... Uh, by all accounts, this is false. They do not have said video, but they use threatening language. Um, they kind of put you on the defensive immediately, um, and uh, some of them are pretty well written to uh, to kind of scare somebody into this. So it is an attack that is on the rise. Um, just a few numbers that Barracuda had put together in terms of attacks, uh, spear phishing attacks targeting businesses. Uh, brand impersonation is still far and away the most common, something that you probably have likely seen in your environment. And um, uh, sextortion actually already almost doubles business email compromise, which is something we've been talking about for a long time. So uh, it's, it's grown quickly and, and, and spread. Um, one second, Gina, let me read your question real quick. Um, that is a good question. Uh, I would, let's see, so it would have been de uh, developed, uh, this was specific to a certain uh, SDK, so if you give me a minute, I will try to pull what that specific uh, software development kit was, um, and uh, we can make sure that that doesn't impact your, uh, your device or your application. Um, and then most targeted industries with uh, sextortion scams, uh, actually in the shading out here might be a little bit difficult to see, but it is uh, education that we've seen uh, that has uh, had the largest um, prevalence of these sextortion attacks, uh, but business services are up there as are government accounts. All right, and then, uh, so that's the last story we had to cover. Um, a few things just to make you aware of. Uh, we do have a free phishing test that we complete for uh, organizations. It's, it extends into our Pulse Aware Security Awareness Training and Monthly Phishing Test program that we have as well. But we can get you started with a free tish, phishing test. Um, I mentioned the weekly security audit. We do have a free trial of this for 30 days for you to test out and see what kind of information has surfaced. In the accounts that we've done it before, we've seen a lot of foreign mailbox box activity. It's something that you want to be on top of regularly as changes to uh, both Office 365 occur and changes to uh, uh, just the, the threat landscape change. Um, and then lastly, of course, uh, anytime you want a free coffee, uh, I'm happy to have a conversation. Bruce Ward is happy to have a conversation and kind of talk through some of the things that are covered in this webinar and how you can, uh, can secure your environment um, a little bit better. Other events um, that, that we have coming up uh, on April 4th, uh, we will, I will be hosting an event that's a webinar called We're On It, uh, Managed Services, um, and that will cover some of our, our managed services a little bit more in depth. We'll have a follow-up uh, webinar on April 24th that uh, focuses specifically on our managed security offerings. Uh, we'll talk about Azure as a data center on April 9th, um, and then uh, 
remember, we're always updating the, the Peters and Associates blog with a, a few blogs a week. Um, so one of the ones out there right now is about new features in Office 2016, um, Teams and how people are using it for uh, project management, and then um, Wi-Fi solutions with, uh, with Meraki. Um, and then this is uh, finally information on us. Uh, we were again named to the CRN uh, MSP uh, 500 list. Um, and that closes out the, the content for today. Gina, I think, and uh, thank you very much for joining today.